Hello, BookTube. I, uh, of course, thought about doing Last Week in BookTube, uh, but the week in question, it, don't get me wrong, it made for great reading, uh, great viewing. I loved it. I loved every minute of it, but my God, it was wall-to-wall -wall the same thing. It was wall-to-wall -wall June wrap-ups and July TBRs. Now, that's just fascinating when, when a, a big group of readers gets together and talks about what they got read and what they plan to read. I'm there. I'll watch. Absolutely. But uh, it doesn't leave much in the way of variety to talk about. There were, there were other videos, but that was so predominantly the theme that not only would I, did I worry that I would just end up repeating myself, but also it made me want to join in. <laughs> so I thought this time around, that's what I do. Instead of, uh, instead of filling the, the uh, info box with links, I would instead fill it with book titles. <laughs> uh, in the month of June, I read 99 books. And believe me, I only realized that after the fact when I counted them up. If I had known on the 29th or 30th of June that I was going to count one shy of 100 for the month, I would have skipped doing something <laughs> and read that one extra book. But I didn't, so 99 is the total. Uh, and it was a really good month. It was full of highlights. Uh, and I jotted some of them down, uh, just a handful of them. And I'm there as a handful of... of stuff from June that I want, or July, that coming up, that uh, I've either read and I'm going to reread, or I'm encountering for the first time that I wanted to show you. Uh, for June, we had uh, The Gene by Siddhartha Mukherjee, which was every bit as good as I was expecting it to be. Big, fat book about the history of genetics, the nature of them, personal, uh, the personal dimensions. He talks to, as usual, he talks to dozens and dozens of people. Uh, just an immersive reading experience, science writing the way it should be done. Uh, then, of course, there was Ingratitude by Jenny Diskey, the book I've mentioned it on this channel before, her memoir of dying, uh, at the end of which she finishes, writes the end, and then dies. <laughs> and it was it was beautiful, it was wonderful. I read it ahead of time, then I read it again and reviewed it uh, in June, and then was heartbroken all over again. Uh, there was that big red book that I showed you, Russia's Path Toward Enlightenment by G.M. Hamburg, uh, all about the, the fomenting religious and social elements in Russian society for the, for the three centuries before the so-called enlightened despots, before Catherine the Great and Peter the Great. And I admit, going in, I thought, well, this is, this is big and meaty, but uh, there's a strong chance that this that this author is going to get lost in his subject. But no, <laughs> no, it was a singularly impressive performance from beginning to end. Just intellectual history done as a circus ride. It was just amazing. I loved it. Uh, and then in terms of fiction, uh, the best novel that I read in the month of June, I, and I reviewed it, uh, is almost certainly going to be one of the best novels I read this year, and that was Annie Proulx's Bark Skins her gigantic historical novel about two rival families of loggers in the New World and the Old World who uh, don't have much in common in their finances, in their people, in their attitudes towards Native Americans. Uh, they have one thing in common and is that for the longest time, in fact, for too long a time, they think the natural resources of the forests of the New World are limitless. And they're wrong. And uh, it was... A tremendous, tremendous performance on, on Annie Poole's part. I can't praise it high enough. If you see it in a bookstore, I'd be hard-pressed to believe you wouldn't like it if you read it. Uh, and that was those were some highlights from June. And I wanted to show you uh, the some highlights of what's coming up in July, stuff that I've either read already or I'm eager to get into. But the, the one last thing from June that I had to show you was this. Meg Night Stalkers, the latest in the Meg series, which was just delightful. <laughs> Something happens on page, I think it's page four of this book, and I thought, well, <laughs> the most predictable thing that would come from what just happened would be that in 200 pages, why happens? <laughs> 
totally forgot that I thought that on page four and then 200 pages later. Why happened? Because, <laughs> because why be original <laughs> when you can write Meg novels for a living? <laughs> I ask you. <laughs> but anyway, uh, coming up for July, we might as well, might as well uh, segue from one guilty pleasure book to another. And that's this, The Dinosaur Knights by Victor Milan. This is a sequel to The Dinosaur Lords, uh, an alternate fantasy world in which dinosaurs are ridden into battle as beasts of war, and <laughs> there are all sorts of different species of them. The books are wonderfully done. There are spot illustrations all throughout, uh, and I know the cheese factor is high, <laughs> very high, but still, Victor Merlin writes the hell out of these books. <laughs> they, are, they are tremendously enjoyable. Uh, and this is coming out in July, and I will I will be reviewing it. <laughs> uh, then, moving slightly up, but still in the realm of escapist fiction, would be uh, this. This is The Castle of Kings by Oliver uh, P-O-T-Z-S-C-H-E. I think that's probably pronounced O'Connor. <laughs> uh, he wrote a series of... Uh, murder mystery set in Germany uh, in, in the past, historical murder mysteries, starring the hangman of a village, and they are wonderful. There's one of them is called The Iron Monk. You'll love it. Uh, this is his big historical novel, something that isn't a murder mystery. Uh, sort of, I mean, the, the cover copy actually makes comparison with uh, Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett. Uh, so I thought I'd read you just a bit of, uh, in 1590, in 1524, in what is now Germany, hundreds of thousands of peasants revolted against the harsh treatment by their aristocratic overlords. Uh, Agnes is the daughter of one of those overlords, but she is not a typical 16 year old, 16th century girl, refusing to wear dresses and spending more time with her pet falcon than with potential suitors. There is only one suitor she is interested in, Mathis, a childhood friend whom she can never marry because he is a commoner. Uh, now, I have intentionally held off on reading this thing. I have a finished copy up there, and I will, I will be reading it uh, soon, in a, matter, in a matter of days. Uh, you can see the fantasy element already just in the plot description, unfortunately. So you'd be straining at that. First of all, she wouldn't do it. It wouldn't matter if she, was, if she loved him. She wouldn't have anything to do with him socially if he was a commoner. And also... Realistically speaking, she wouldn't love him. She would consider him another form of life. And even more realistically speaking, if both of those things somehow ended up being true, she would have her defiance beaten out of her by her mother uh, with a stick, with starvation. Uh, but uh, that's part of the fun of escapist historical fiction is the, the you know the what if factor and talk about what if factor the next one has so much buzz around it now, i also haven't read it yet so this is kind of amazing it's this thing i can't wait to get to it underground airlines this is by ben winters let me read you <laughs> this is a bit of this tell me you don't want to read it as soon as you finish this uh it is the present day and the world is as we know it smartphones social networking happy meals uh save for one thing the Civil War never happened. A gifted young black man calling himself Victor has struck a bargain with federal law enforcement acting as a bounty hunter for the U.S. Marshal Service. He's got plenty of work. In this version of America, slavery continues in four states, the hard four. On the, tri on the trail of a runaway known as Jackdaw, Victor arrives in Indianapolis knowing that something isn't right with the case file, with his work, and with the country. A mystery to himself, Victor suppresses his memories of his childhood on a plantation and works to infiltrate the local cell of an abolitionist movement called the Underground Airlines, tracking Jackdaw through the back rooms of churches, empty parking garages, hotels, and medical offices. Victor believes he's hot on the trail, but his strange, increasingly Byzantine pursuit is complicated by a boss who won't reveal the extraordinary stakes of Jackdaw's case, and by a slightly unmoored young woman and her child who could be Victor's salvation. Victor himself may be the biggest obstacle of all. Uh, though his past remains buried, it threatens to surface. <laughs> I, uh, I have a feeling I'm going to like this. We'll see. Uh, and then next one is uh, right up my alley. It's a Roman murder mystery. This is Vita Bravis. This is by Ruth Downey. And this is, it's, I think it's the fourth, uh, no, it's the seventh. It's the seventh novel in her Medicus series. 
which follows her main character living in the colony of Britain. Uh, the the uh, first Medicus book, first two, I think, uh, struck me as a little dull. I read them because I read all Roman historical fiction, but uh, I, I read them dutifully. I didn't really enjoy them. The series has been getting better since then, and this looks to be very good. I, <laughs> I'm greatly looking forward to it. And uh, the last one, I just realized now that I'm looking at this, I have not read any of these. That's that's uh, kind of amazing. Well, good. That's what ITBRs are for. Uh, and the next one is I Am No One. There's another novel. It's by Patrick Flannery. And again, a killer description. Wait till you read this. Uh, after a decade living in England, Jeremy O'Keefe returns to New York, where he has been hired as a professor of German history at New York University. Though comfortable in his new life and happy to be near his daughter once again, Jeremy continues to feel the quiet pangs of loneliness. Walking through the city at night, he feels as though he could disappear and no one would even notice. But soon, Jeremy's life begins taking strange turns. Boxes containing records of his online activity are delivered to his apartment. A young man seems to be following him, and his elderly mother receives anonymous phone calls slandering her son. Why, he wonders, would anyone want to watch him so closely? And even more upsetting, why would they alert him to the fact that he was being watched? As Jeremy takes stock of the entanglements that marked his years abroad, he wonders if he has unwittingly committed a crime so serious that he must soon be faced with his own denaturalization. Moving toward a shattering reassessment of what it means to be free in a time of ever more intrusive surveillance, Jeremy is forced to ask himself whether he is no one, as he believes, or a traitor not just to his country, but to everyone around him. So, a thinking person's thriller, and for once, uh, an American cover design that I can live with. <laughs> uh, so there you have it. That's, that's uh, there's a, a bit of uh, July's reading that's coming up for me. Uh, and I'd love to know what you think of any of these, especially if, you know, you've read any of them, uh, or read the previous volume, like, for instance, The Dinosaur Lords. <laughs> uh, and also, you know, I, you know, Pro forma, ask what you will be reading. Although, if you're on BookTube, you've certainly made that video. Already. I'm just jumping in, having and joining the fun. Uh, and we'll be back to rants and halls in no time at all. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.